welcome uh, everybody to uh, this year's uh, small farm webinar series. Uh, I'll give a little bit of an introduction here in a minute, but um, just to remind everybody on your screen there, you can see that the series will go through the next three months, and we have a really neat list of topics and speakers coming up. And just to let you know, the, the way that we come up with these sessions and the topics each year is uh, we, we ask as we're going through in the year, you know, when we're doing programs all over and webinars and things like that, you know, what else would you like to have some training on? And that's how we come up with the list, the list that we have. And we got some interesting new ones this year. Uh, they're all new topics, but we included some things that are some uh, niche marketing, um, market development type things that are happening. Um, so, for instance, uh, Grant McCarty is a colleague of ours in Northern Illinois is going to be talking next week about growing hops. Um, that's an up-and-coming up crop, uh, not only in northern Illinois, but all around the state. We've got other things. Uh, uh, Bill Davison is out of uh, Bloomington, and he's going to talk about some perennial cropping systems to kind of reduce labor costs on small farms. Uh, and then we've got some business topics in here this year. For instance, Veggie, Comp Veggie Compass will be uh, one of them that we'll be talking about uh, later on this year, and that's with Andy Larson. Andy's relatively new to us and has a lot of experience on the business side of small farms. And then we've got the things you got to remember, you know, to take care of, like the, the marketing. And uh, Deborah Cavanaugh Grant, whom probably most of you online here already know or know the name, is going to talk with us about some uh, marketing, uh, marketing ideas and, and uh, things you can do to help market your products. So uh, we've got a really neat, neat year coming up. I'm really excited about it. So no-till culture for tomato and pepper. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, um, I'm uh, Kyle Cecil, and I work over here in the Galesburg, uh, Macomb uh, area, over here on the western side of the state. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is an applied project that we, we conducted at the uh, research farm in uh, Monmouth. And this was this last year, and I had several colleagues that helped me with this, and I'll recognize them here after a while. But uh, basically what we wanted to do was we wanted to look at, you know, how can we reduce labor costs with, with tomato and pepper production by using a couple of different combination of tactics and, and in addition to that, you know, using a no-till type approach. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'll, I'll just let you know with, with basically all of these sessions that you're going to attend, we're going to speak to you much more from the practical on the ground side of things. There's science behind what we're doing. but uh, I'm a grower myself, uh, in, in addition to being an extension educator, and what you really want to know is, you know, did it work and, and how might I replicate it? So that's the, that's the approach we're going to take. <clears throat> so where, where are we at here? We're, we're over the research farm that we have in, is in Monmouth. We have four of them across the state. The one that I work at or with is at Monmouth. And, and you can see this aerial picture. That's our research farm that there's mostly corn, soybean, and uh, wheat and some small grains research going on. But if you look up by the, up by the, there's a little uh, old garage on the bottom left-hand corner of the, of the uh, picture there. We have a tiny little research plot there. We get a lot done. But I really appreciate the opportunity um, to have that. So no-till. No-till is an arbitrary term kind of uh, because anyone that no-tills kind of has their different definition for it. But basically what we were looking at in this system was that we didn't want to have to go in there and work the ground several times, you know, uh, either with plowing something down and disking and what have you. We wanted to go in there as low, as low input labor as we could. So it's, it's kind of self-defined, okay? And then, you know, the culture is just how everything how everything grows. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. So why were we studying this? Tomatoes and peppers, you know, are one of the crops that the growers that I work with, you know, uh, they're foundational to, to what they provide each, uh, each season to their, to their clients. So anything we can do, you know, to, to help reduce some of the costs that we have with those major crops that we have is going to help us out. We're always looking for, um, we're always looking for ways to reduce labor on all of our crops. And then, and then since we use, you'll see in a minute, we use cereal rye. Um, if you're growing to organic standards, even if you're not certified, you know, we have to look towards different ways that we can reduce our chemical weed control methods. So that's, that's the reason why we're doing it, okay? So now we'll get into what, what we did. 
And so this is our little plot that I showed you earlier from an aerial. And this is the cereal rye seeding that we seeded in August. And uh, you see all the leaves are off the tree. So this is later, this is later in the fall. Uh, the corn has been harvested around and everything. So I don't remember exactly what the date of this was. It was probably towards the end of October, 1st of November. But here's one of the first keys you want to remember if you're going to use an approach like this and using uh, some of these uh, cover crops for wheat, subsequent weed control is um, you've got to get the seeding. You've got to get that seeding on in the right time. And, and basically for our area, uh, you know, it, it's an August seeding. So you want to get that crop out there and establish at the right, right time. If you tried to do what we did, uh, and you didn't seed this until October and November, I don't think you would have had any luck because you wouldn't have had that seeding in there soon enough to, to establish a good seeding. Um, oddly enough, the year, uh, the August that we seeded this, there is a, a large uh, long-term cover crop trial at the farm, and this was the only, um, this was the only uh, rye that survived at the farm was that on our plot. So uh, that was kind of interesting that year too. Here's just another uh, look at our plot, and, and there's no flags on it at this point, but if you look down through there from, from the left side of the picture to the right, basically we have different, uh, uh, we have areas that you can tell that, that, you know, died out or didn't get seeded and what have you, and, and we would typically see that, you know, in, in most field settings. You're not going to get a perfect stand, but we did experience some of that, uh, uh, you know, a, a seeding that, that wasn't perfect. But, you know, this seeding compared to what most of the uh, plots at the trial had uh, did really well. So that's a look at what we started with. And, and just, just a quick note on this screen is uh, throughout Illinois, we're having a lot of trouble uh, with winter annual weeds. And if you, and, and our plot there for the last three years that we've been working, uh, there's a tremendous uh, population of winter annual weeds in, in that plot and uh, we deal with them every year you know we try to do what we can to um, decrease the numbers of those but um, typically what we find especially if you're if you're uh, if you're gonna do much no-tilling in, in any circumstance winter annual weeds are a real issue and and those are the typical ones that we have dealt with and if you want any more information on lifestyle or uh, the life histories of these weeds just crop on or get onto that crop science site there that I have for you or just type in weeds Illinois and it'll it'll come up so they're a real challenge so let's hop ahead a little bit and um, um, so there's different approaches to um, uh, no-till and vegetables and these are a couple from uh, uh, pictures North Carolina State and, and around in Virginia and so the one on the top is uh, is basically that's a that's a pretty nice one. That's your Cadillac of, of uh, no-till transplanters there. And uh, the 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 ones on the bottom are more of what we've been using at the farm. And the thing I want to uh, point out is on that uh, picture B there. You don't need a real fancy system to no-till. You know some of these uh, transplants that we're working at. Basically, there's just a couple of things that, that you need. Uh, or you, maybe you can modify some equipment that you have. So you don't have to have that picture at the top there, but boy, if you were, I mean, if you were going to consistently do this, that's something that you would uh, want to consider. But it doesn't have to be really fancy. And the other reason I put this picture up is, is just to, you know, let you know this is going on all over the country. So um, there's there's a lot of people that are that are producing uh, this way. Okay, so. One of the things that we're trying to imitate as we go into some of these small plots on, on, on our farms is, is, for instance, in the top left corner, that Iowa State University picture, that's a picture of basically, they're at the research farm they have, and that's a crimper roller on the front of the tractor. And, and, and we used a, a crimper roller at the farm. Uh, so I'll talk about how that works, but basically that roller rolls over that living plant tissue and crushes it and kills the growing point. And then what you do in the same direction that it was it was crimped and rolled, you go in there and you plant with your with your specialized equipment. Now they're they're probably planting, you know, a corn or soybean crop there, but that's the basic idea of what we're trying to do. So um, 
so instance, for instance, the, the, the no-till, uh, I won't even call it a planter that we use at the farm, we've just basically put together from odds and ends that we've had or things that you can get on eBay and what have you. So, for instance, I just saw this picture here a couple days about a couple days ago about some of these no-till coulters that help slice the soil, and uh, you can get those for next to nothing, you know, on at auctions or Craigslist or anything like that. So, once again, it doesn't have to be fancy. Okay, so here we are, and uh, we've we've uh, fast forwarded to summer uh, at the plot. And if you look in the picture, what you can see is, is we've crimped and rolled the rye. So the rye was, you know, uh, about, about waist high, let's say. Rye grows very, very quickly in the spring. Uh, rye is one that once the growing conditions get right and it gets warm, it grows very, very fast. So you want to crimp that rye, you know, basically before it heads out. Uh, and that kind of coincides with when we want to get out there and get uh, peppers and tomatoes out there. So another thing I want you to notice about this picture is um, all of the rye is leaning in, in, in the same direction. Now, our plot is small enough that it was no big deal for us to drive around to the other end and drive through and roll that the other way. But if you use, if you go in there and use a, like a mechanical type of a ripper or something like that, a small ripper to, to you know, dig a furrow for these plants, um, you need to make sure you're going with the same direction as, those, as the rye was crimped or else you'll just end up raking rye across the, uh, across the plot and you'll be, you'll be really, it, it doesn't work well. Now like that picture I showed you before, the interesting thing about crimping these is like this picture of the tractor in the top left corner, see they're planting the very day um, they're planting the very day that they're they're crimping that, and they don't have as long as you're going with the direction that you're crimping, you don't have any any problem there. So, uh, and if you look in the chat there, my colleague Deborah Grant's got uh, another uh, link there for you on some crimping techniques, so you can take a look at that. So, um, on this plot, um, I'll make note too: the plot was small enough that we we went ahead and put these in by hand. So our no-till was was you know, basically, we we didn't do any tillage. We just dug holes for our transplants. But we have used, and, and I have the same thing at home as this bottom one on the left, the bee. It's a very simple. We have one contraption that we use to, to plant uh, uh, transplants and garlic and dig potatoes and, and what have you. So um, very, very low tech here. So this is the day that we planted. And then uh, that rye was crimped on a Friday. And we came in on a Monday and, and planted our plant. So you can see that, you know, it's still pretty green in that. And it takes a little while for it to, uh, for it to die. Uh, but you've got to get a really good crimp on that or it will pop right back up. And uh, uh, it'll just keep growing. It'll grow, you know, four or five feet tall. So uh, here's just a, a real quick picture. Our outside row was peppers, and, and we strung it out there and, and planted those by hand. And basically, we didn't do anything. We didn't move any residue whatsoever. We just found our spacing and, and dug the, the uh, transplants in that, that we grew here, in the, or here on the farm. OK, so, so then what, what did we do? Well, there's a couple things I want you to look at on this picture, uh, and we'll spend a little bit of time here. So what we're doing with this project, we wanted to grow cereal rye, and we wanted to grow cereal rye so we could plant into a cover crop, and uh, cereal rye helps to keep a lot of our small broadleaf uh, weeds from growing. So we were wanting that. It's going to hold soil moisture, add to organic matter, what have you. Uh, as I was putting this project together, I, I did a, a, a literature review of what's been going on out there in the country, and there's been a lot of work out in Virginia with this combination of cereal rye and no-till, and then a combination of cereal, cereal rye and fabric. So um, what, and I talked with several of those research out there, researchers out there, and, and the conclusion that they found from their research was that um, they didn't get satisfactory weed control in this cereal rye system unless they did a couple of different things with this fabric. So what we did was, 
I'll show you in a minute, we would, we would move this fabric at certain intervals uh, during the trial to see how the fabric helped enhance some of this weed control. So that's one thing. Uh, number two about this slide is you can see some of the rye has, has headed out and popped back up. Uh, we don't have uh, a crimper roller like the one, if you go to the link that uh, Deborah Grant uh, just gave us, we don't have one that nice. We're doing it pretty low key there at the farm, and it doesn't work perfectly. It works very well, but you can see that there were some of the stems that it didn't get crimped and the plant didn't die. So, so some of that was coming back up. And then lastly on this slide, I want to note that you can see the weeds in the foreground there. Those are those winter annual weeds I was talking about. So um, uh, on the outsides of the plots, kind of as your control, you can see those were pretty significant. Okay, so this is looking at our plot, and we are probably, I think, well, I know I can tell you what we would be. We were three weeks into it. And uh, I'll have a closer picture on the end there, but on the far end, right-hand side of the picture, you can see that we have a long strip of fabric and we have a shorter strip. So what our idea was, and based on the work that's been done at Virginia was, we wanted, we did the crimping, you know, like they said, and the no-till. And by the way, there's no chemical weed control on this one. We're trying to, to do it uh, organically on this plot this year. So. Uh, the work in Virginia showed that if you if you didn't use a fabric for a while, that weed control didn't last for 12 weeks or the whole season. So what they did and what we replicated was we took that fabric barrier and we would move it at two-week intervals. So on the very end of this trial, here's a close-up of it. At the very end of this trial on the right-hand side, you can see we've moved the black plastic down. And we moved it down after two weeks. So at the end, at the far side of that trial, that's underneath there is what it looks like after two weeks. So we planted it that day, two weeks ago. We planted it, and then we moved the fabric after two weeks. So after two weeks of that combination, uh, we had virtually 100% weed control uh, on the sides and the rows within, uh, within that part of the plot. So we would move it down, you know, two weeks. So now we've got a combination of we've got post planting for two weeks. And so some of the broadleaf weeds were able to come up and we move the fabric down and put those on two weeks. So what we would look at is how was the weed control in that plot? So as we moved it down again, it would have been had a month without uh, fabric on it. And we wanted to see what it did with, with weeds there. So the inside of the, the trial there by the orange flag are the tomatoes, and the outside is the, is the peppers, or the peppers that we grew. So here's a little schematic of, of the protocol that, that we used to move the fabric barrier. And so, you know, we had rows of tomatoes and rows of peppers, and so the fabric would start on the right-hand end, and we just move it every two weeks until we got to the, to the very end, and then we could take a look at how weed control was uh, with the plot. Now this is a this was just a demonstration plot. So later on, we didn't take, we didn't weigh fruit uh, pounds per plant or, or what have you, because we were just wanting to do an observation of how this worked with the uh, with weed control. So uh, we just kept moving the fabric barrier down every two weeks. And and I think I mentioned, but I want to do it again. The reason for the two week was based on the work in Virginia. That was kind of the the minimum that you had to have on there to uh, help control the weeds. So here's a, here's another a little better close up of once we've moved all the all the the, uh, the fabric down. And I would mention there's nothing. It's a you, you don't want to use black plastic for this. Okay, you want to use a, a fabric. So what's the difference between black plastic and a fabric? The fabric is going to let water you know soak through uh, and what have you. Uh, we we're not able to uh, put any drip lines or anything in on this particular plot yet. So any water that those plants get out there is just naturally from rainwater. So uh, just to you know just to make it very simple, we just went into the local you know hardware type store and uh, bought their landscaping fabric and and that's what we're using there. It's nothing nothing fancy. Uh, you will see in the bottom left hand corner that we did buy the uh, the handled spikes. Um, 
and um, you've got to make sure that that fabric doesn't blow away. If, if you if you've ever been to the farm out there in Monmouth, you'll know this, but it is in the middle of a of a you know million acre prairie out there, so the wind blows all the time out there. So we had to make sure that that was tied down. Um, Observations from this is that um, I was just I was astounded at the weed control. I mean, I thought there would be some you know some some broad leaves broad leaves that were slipping through in there uh, when we first pulled that fabric back, and and it was you know nothing is a hundred percent, but I couldn't have asked for any more any better weed control in that uh, with the first time that we moved that that black fabric. So um, that you couldn't ask for any nicer rows there. So this is uh, a little further down the line. I don't uh, have a time frame on this. Uh, we're probably looking at, uh, I bet that would be uh, three weeks or a month uh, since we planted. Uh, we just used a floor to weave. Um, nothing special about that on, on the plot there. But we used a floor to weave for uh, um, staking those plants. So what we're looking at here is, um, this plot that you're looking, or the close-up that you're seeing here, is basically that would be the second time that we move the fabric down. So those plants uh, had been in there for four weeks, one month, and then we move the fabric. So you can see here at this point um, the plot you're looking at for the first two weeks after planting. It didn't have anything on it other than the cereal rye, and what. You know, most studies have shown us is that the cereal rye does have, you know, some effect on small seeded broadleaves. So hopefully that was working for us out there. Uh, the fabric, you know, we moved it in, and after, you know, initial two weeks of growing, none of the weeds were so big that we couldn't control them again with fabric. So um, that's pretty impressive for, you know, four weeks four weeks into the season there. And, and the, one of the reasons that you use cereal rye uh, is because there's a lot of there's a lot of stem there. I mean, it, it's going to take a while for that stuff to break down, and and the longer it takes for that to break down, you know, it keeps sunlight from getting to the ground and germinating seeds. And and remember, another thing about this is we were no-tilling this, so we we didn't stir up any seeds to have them germinated, to get them germinated at all as well. Okay, so we're gonna we're jumping ahead quite a bit now. This. These are our uh, cherry tomatoes. We had we had several different varieties of tomatoes in the plot. Uh, that wasn't really very important to us, but uh, these are where we had some uh, uh, different types of cherry tomatoes in there. And I want you to, to look close. So uh, what we have in this picture, you can see at the base of the plants is the fabric barrier. So we haven't yet moved it from that spot. Um, so the fabric barrier would have only been there for let's say we're at the last day, 14 days, okay? Uh, but you can see that any of the, uh, any of the weeds, uh, there's part of our control is right in front of it. So if we had done nothing at all, that's what we would have seen the tomatoes growing in. I mean, and the tomatoes would have grown in it, but they wouldn't have done nearly as well as what they did with the, uh, with the weed control and the, and the fabric barrier and what have you. So, um, and that's that's basically what we're what we're concerned about is you know both sides of that row you know we want any of the nutrients and and uh, water and everything going into that that row of tomatoes so so the the, the combination of all of these worked uh, we can't say what one thing did and I doubt that you know it's it's never just one thing but this combination compared to the control that you can see uh, in your foreground was was really impressive. Okay, so this is um, this is at the the very end of our plot of our tomato plot, and I know that because there's our end end uh, post for our uh, trellising system, and so this section of tomatoes would have not that it would have went um, two four six it would have went six weeks with only uh, the cereal rye. For weed control on that end and then uh, since it's at the end of the plot then it would have got the fabric barrier for another two weeks and and like I said um, 
And on this, this is a good picture too, because in the foreground you see the weeds. Um, that's the control, so we didn't do anything. But we did have, you know, weed growth in in that plot. But the interesting thing about that, and it wasn't significant, really. But the interesting thing about that was, as we would expect, that fabric barrier on there for two weeks uh, did did the trick. I mean, there, you know, uh, it cleaned the row up very very quickly. And I'll just point out on this on this plot also, you know, we've got our summer, you know, we've got our summer annuals coming in now, and we still got some of the the tail end of the winter annuals, but uh, we had plenty of weed pressure to to uh, to try this. Uh, Try this scenario out. Excuse me. So what this is a picture of is uh, we popped over one row, and we have our pepper plants there. And a couple of things to point out uh, in in this picture. This is towards the end of our uh, pepper row, just like the, the the prior picture. So this area, you you see more weeds. Uh, uh, in this part of the uh, trial because it didn't get the barrier for you know at least four to six weeks before we got down there the barrier did control the weeds very effectively once we got once we got there I would point out that you can see in between these these pepper plants uh, rye so that rye will head out and, and mature there the ones that didn't get crimped well and and that's what we want you know because that the rye is taking up nutrients and water and things like that so um, you want to get as, as good a kill as you can. Uh, I'll make a. I want to make a note on a roller. I have worked with a grower that was really ingenious and built a crimper roller out of a uh, a water filled lawn roller and welded uh, metal cleats onto it. The cleats are what crimps it uh, as it turns. You can't just go out there with a lawn roller because you would only get one crimp in the stem. You want to have like ten crimps. So um, that's something that I would like to actually try long term. So if you happen to have something like that or you're at a sale sometime and you can pick something like that up, you might want to do that because that would work very well at uh, crimping that rye. So as I said, we would expect this to be dirtier, you know, with weeds, weedier down at this end, uh, and we did. But it was never anything from, from an organic standard and a production standard that, that, that we were ever uh, concerned about. So we and and you see in the in the chat there that uh, it's been tried what I what I suggested there so that's confirming that. Um, so uh, our goal, you know, as a grower, our goal isn't to have perfectly clean fields because there are thresholds to which some of these weeds aren't really going to matter, you know. And and there's more into that decision than just having the weeds there or not, you know. If you're getting more for your produce. Um, you know, a weed or two isn't going to matter to you, so um, that's just something to think about. Okay, so we've, uh, this would be towards um, end of July, I think, and we're back on the very first part of the plot where we put the, where we put the uh, barrier down at the start. So, you know, we're probably six plus weeks into the growing season since we transplanted, and so there's been no weed control, you know, on this plot, at this end of the plot, since we took that barrier off at two weeks. And you can see in the picture there that, that dead, matted cereal rye straw, um, you know, it's done its job. It killed the, the small seeded broad leaves early. The fabric came by and any that got through, the fabric barrier took care of. But uh, we had good weed control. You know what the what the cereal rye didn't help get. You know, however it does it, the fabric got, and then we, and then these plants were vigorous enough uh, that you know they they helped to contribute to some of the weed control. Um, so, um, so that's just to show you kind of what things would uh, what things would do. Okay, so let's go ahead here. One picture. This is a close up. Uh, my photographer colleague Chris Enroth took for me, and this is a close up. I can't remember where we are at on the plot, but the one thing that I wanted to show you was next to the row, you know, we've got really good weed control in there. We've got some weeds, some purslane in there, there's some dandelions, 
and things like that. So this is a close-up of the row. You can see the cereal rye straw is in there, and it's still helping. Like I said, we've got weeds. I think if you if you look close, kind of where's Waldo? There's a maple leaf. Uh, there's a maple leaf uh, growing there, uh, with in a maple tree growing within the row there. So uh, uh, so that was kind of interesting. But you know, we do have good weed control next to the plants where uh, everything is growing. Uh, I can tell you that this area, uh, right in the middle of your picture, or right in front of or to the right of the barrier, uh, that would be an area that went four weeks with just the crimp rye, no barrier, and it went two weeks with the barrier. And this is the, the weed control that, that we got there. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner is our row to give you some idea on distance between rows, about four feet is our pepper row on the right hand side. So we've got some we've got some weeds, you know, coming through as we would expect, but but uh, uh, you'll notice most of those are grass, like I said, grass type leaves. Uh, I think the cereal rye did its thing. So that's a, that's a pretty nice clean clean row for what we're trying to achieve. Uh, that's just a, I just took a picture of another uh, uh, maple maple leaf in there and uh, Monmouth is known as the uh, uh, a maple uh, maple community, so that's a picture of that. Purs Lane is in there, but we still have, have uh, relatively good weed control. I've seen a lot worse, and, and I, I think you've seen a lot worse, too, uh, on your farm. So this is a picture. I, I didn't, didn't need a lot of these, but this is a picture of uh, some of the plants that we had, you know, and producing out there. Like I said, we were just wanting to do observations of weed control, so this is a picture of, of some of the fruit we produce. Now, a thing about this, like I said, we didn't weigh the fruit. Um, uh, that wasn't part of our protocol, but we had tremendous, we had a tremendous growing season last year uh, up in this part of the area. We had, you know, rain when we needed it. Um, everything went well. So this, this is one of the years that, um, you know, it's hard to say why exactly we would have you know, in this particular plot, such such quality fruit. Um, uh, one of you know one of the reasons uh, we had such good fruit there was it's never had tomatoes on it ever. So we had virtually no disease, you know, no nothing. And uh, remember, in this system, this plot that we did, we didn't have access. We couldn't put in drip lines. So anything that got watered just got naturally watered, and uh, uh, just a tremendous tremendous crop out there. Um, uh, is is what we continue to see. So um, I'm not saying that that you know there's a lot of things that happen to make a good quality crop. So I guess it took us 32 slides to get to the main things that I wanted you to walk away with. And uh, here, here's what we observed. And I, I will tell you that that our observations on what we saw were exactly like what uh, the the researchers in Virginia had, had told me. They 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 witnessed too. So, um, uh, so I was, I was glad to hear that. What did we see? Uh, winter annuals can be really hard to control uh, if you don't get your cover crop in early. And so if uh, when it's time to plant cover crops, you know, let's just say it's August 15th. If it's time to plant cover crops for, for doing some of these weed control practices, you need to make sure that that's the priority for you to get those in and establish. Uh, because you don't want your, your winter annuals getting in there and, and uh, taking off and taking control of your plots. Uh, the fabric barrier, uh, we witnessed this, as did Virginia, uh, really did a good good job on small seeded broadleaves. Um, we also uh, saw that it would effectively control them, you know, as they got bigger. Now, the bigger ones are the ones that slip through, you know, maybe at, at one time or they were able to establish themselves easy. But the, the you know, the cleanest plot, uh, we had effective control for 12 weeks throughout the plot. I think the cleanest plot that we had was the very first plot that got right at planting and crimping, got that fabric barrier for the two weeks. It stayed the cleanest of all the plots uh, that we had there. Uh, so the, the third third thing there is two weeks of this fabric barrier 
uh, between the rows worked very well and, and kept our weed populations down for 12 weeks, which, you know, is, is that's, that's pretty substantial. That's a long time for us uh, out there. And I say that it, uh, um, I say that it controlled it. It didn't, it didn't eliminate it. Um, I'm just, I'm using August 15th as in general. I, we didn't seed until later, later on the year before. And remember we seeded our, our plots here, we didn't have tomatoes in that before. So if we were going in to put cereal rye in for the next year, we'd obviously have to go further than August 15th based on the variety that we had. So good point, Kathy. Um, so we got good control, but we didn't eliminate weeds and we knew that we wouldn't eliminate weeds. Uh, that wasn't something that we, we saw as a goal, but we were very happy with how it did it, you know, from a commercial standpoint. So there's way too much on this slide. I'm not going over everything, but um, I want to hit on some high, uh, some some points that Virginia, the, the researchers out there, came up with on the, on the attempting the no-till in the system. So a couple of things they said was, you know, get the cover crop seeded in the right time. Um, you want to you want to crimp that uh, uh, cover crop before it heads out. You know, if you have really significant weed populations before you start this no-till type of a system, you need to get them under control first. Uh, because uh, especially if you're, you know, growing organic standards, your toolbox of how you're going to control those significant weed populations is, is a, it can, can be challenging, okay? You want to use transplants in these systems. Uh, we had really healthy big transplants that we were using. Um, some of the work in Virginia, they have tried this with large seeded uh, vegetables. We, we did transplanted peppers and, and uh, uh, tomatoes, so those plants just take off and Make sure they're vigorous and what have you. And then uh, another thing was that you know you've got to be able to get that good crimp on 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 that cover crop if you're going to go in and no-till into those. And you can see from a couple of the growers online here today, they've created some some crimpers and that work well. And uh, you know you just need to make sure that you get multiple crimps on that stem to get that killed so it just doesn't pop up and start growing again. Um, uh, so, and on the other side, when not to use it, if, you know, if, if you didn't get your cover crop seeded right, if it's weedy, uh, um, the no-till will be very challenging if you have heavy soils. Uh, we have a, a silty loam over there in Monmouth, I mean, just as black as tar and uh, a lot of organic matter and it works really well. If you have, you know, uh, kind of waterlogged soils, heavy clay soils, it might be a little challenging, you know, to get this type of a system to work. Um, but uh, uh, you just have to, every, every farm is going to be different too. There's, um, I, I tried to take advice from several of the growers that I have that are no-tilling, what have you, and, and uh, they were, if I asked five, they were doing it four or five different ways, so I tried to figure out what was going to work best for us uh, on the farm there. Well, I can't, uh, can't end this without a, a real quick thank you to my colleagues out there at the farm and uh, my colleague Chris Enroth, he's a horticulture educator with us. Appreciate all the work that everybody did on that. They're, they're a great group of people to, uh, to work with on that. So that's the end of, of my presentation. I am going to stay online here and I have a couple of colleagues on uh, that can help me answer questions through the chat box. So we'll, we'll take any questions you have on the uh, chat box and, and I'll stay on here as long as we can. If not, Hope to see you for the next 10 weeks and, and take part in everything. So thanks a lot. Uh, Monica, right. So uh, any of the plot areas only got the, the fabric for two weeks and then we moved on. So n nothing more than two weeks was, was how that worked. Uh, the cover, Kathy, the cover on that, we just rolled it up. We simply at the end of the season, we rolled it up. It was in good shape rolled it back onto its cardboard uh, uh, piece of cardboard and it was like we never even like we never even used it. it it was it was really good shape I think we're gonna probably get two or three more years out of it uh, the old rye um, at the end of this season the the plot has been uh, tilled so all of that old rye with the organic matter was worked into the into the uh, into the plot, uh, Jerry. Yeah, the um, we don't have access to water at that site right now, so we weren't able to irrigate 
at all. So any of the production we got out there was simply from rainwater, and, and we had a good year. So I was nervous about that at the start, but it was all rain. If I had access, I would have put uh, um, drip tape out there. Uh, Springfield, what other crops can be used? You mean as cover? Springfield, do you mean as cover crop or um, other ones that you can no-till? Yeah, the, and I'm going to wait for Springfield to answer that. Um, the uh, fertilizer, we fertilize the, the plot every year based on our soil test and what we're going to be growing. So um, um, that hasn't, that plot hasn't been in production very long, so our fertility is really high. But we'll base that on soil tests, whatever we need for the crop we're going to grow. Okay, let me get caught up here. Fertilizer. And anyone that's saying thank you, appreciate it too. Uh, no additional fertilizer was applied later. We'll uh, go in and, and uh, take another soil test before we do our plots this year based on what we're going to grow. And actually, just FYI, we're going to be putting in a number of things. My colleague, Chris Enroth, is going to do some turf work. Uh, on my end of the plot, we're doing uh, sweet potatoes, uh, have a number of sweet potato uh, collections that we're going to put out there. Yeah, we... we most of the stuff that we do at the farm, we try and, and, and do it the same way that our growers, you know, would do it. So uh, if, it's a, if it's a practice, if they're growing something that it's mostly kind of all hand labor, we'll do that. But by far, most of what it is is we try and, and put these things in with some sort of mechanical aspect to it so we can take advantage of some of the, you know, the, the equipment efficiencies that we might have. Uh, there's nothing special to what we use. Usually, if we don't have it, we build it, uh, that type of thing. But, yeah, in a small plot area, you have to be very careful about how often you drive that tractor through, and you have to be very careful about when you are driving that tractor, you know, through there. So there are times when we might want to get something done, and just like you in, in your plots and your farms, that we won't. We could get the tractor through there, but it's not worth it from the compaction. Because we don't want to have to come in there and, and, you know, use deep rippers and rip that up if we don't have to. We can do that. We have that ability at the farm, but there's not a lot of you that have that ability on, on your farm to do that. So we try and limit that. Uh, getting back to Springfield's uh, cover crop question, are there other crops you can use? Yeah, and, and cover crops, you want to use them based on what your ultimate goal is. So... Uh, cereal rye is one that if you want to, you know, build up your soil, organic matter, uh, weed control, things like that, you would use. You're not going to get a lot of fertility put back in the soil. Um, there are cover crops like, you know, the legumes and hairy vetch and things like that that you can use if you want to put nitrogen in the soil. But you want to use the cover crop based on what uh, your ultimate goal is. So, you know, for this one, um, I, I'm not sure that like an oak crop would work for you because I don't think you get the biomass that you would need by the time you're planting your crops. So you'd want to have something, you know, that you're going to get a lot of biomass and, and seed earlier on. Rye for this type of outcome is the one that you would want to use. For doing what we did, rye is the one we wanted to use. So I answered your one question there. Um, uh, Monica, the, the crops that you could grow, um, you know, we just tried the transplants, uh, as you can, as I made note in the other one, large seeded, uh, other large seeded crops uh, in Virginia they found to work well, you know, in this system. Uh, so, you know, think back to your library of crops that you have uh, the ability to grow, you know, the large seeded ones. That, you know, this certainly wouldn't work for a lettuce or any type of greens or or anything, radishes and things like that. It would have to be a lot larger. Um, I don't see why probably like a green bean type crop wouldn't work well. We know till we know till soybeans, you know, uh, millions of acres here in Illinois. So so that's a consideration. The large seeded crops are the ones that you'd want. Okay, uh, what do you suggest to start a new plot that is currently grass and weeds? Um, what I'd suggest to you, if it's a new area that you're going to grow, you know, you're probably, you know, 
as you're probably going to want to do some tillage and and if you decide to do tillage or not the, the very first thing you got to do is get the weed the weeds and grass control there because if you don't get them uh, controlled at the start you're gonna um, you're gonna fight them all year all year long so so um, why don't you send me an email like it, it's a little more complicated than that you send me an email and uh, I'll see if I can talk to you a little bit about that a little more about that I'm just gonna put my email back up here if anyone needs it uh, okay Substituting landscape fabric with paper. Make sure the paper doesn't have a waxy coating. Yes. Okay, Chris is Chris is my Hort colleague. So he makes note about the no waxy papers uh, to use those, and uh, we've got to be able to uh, uh, keep photosynthesis from happening, but making sure that water can infiltrate down there. Okay, did you find any stunted growth to planting early after crimping? Um, we found virtually none, and uh, uh, we didn't find any stunting whatsoever. Those plants just, just took off and thrived. Now, they were healthy. I mean, they, it was probably the nicest, you know, trays of flats of, of, of uh, transplants I've ever grown. So it, they were really good plants. And, re, and remember, I said the weather was fabulous. Um, so, uh, uh, but, so we didn't see any at all, Kurt. Good question. Uh, Kankakee, what animals were encouraged by the plastic? Well, um, since the time of year, if we had plastic or the mulch down in the fall and the winter, we would have had voles everywhere. Um, we didn't have any animal issues, mice or voles. Voles are typically what you would deal with, especially getting back there uh, with uh, talking about, you know, pumpkins later on, uh, cereal rye and, um, you know, some of the plastic and things like that, you're going to have some unbelievable mole issues or vole issues with that. But we had none, uh, but, and that was simply because of the time of the year that, that we were growing. Um, Why did you only leave the plastic down for two weeks? That's what I talked about earlier was that was the protocol that uh, these research projects have been done in other parts of the country, and, and that's what they found is you only need it down for the two weeks. Uh, and then you can move it along. Uh, so that's what that's what we wanted to try and replicate that. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? No, we don't do any inoculation there. And we're not. It's there's no plants that we need inoculation for. It's we've got high organic matter and what have you. So we're we're good there. Um, Mike Rogi, did you? Are you still, are you on Mike Rogie? No, he's not on. Okay. Um, I wanted to get him in on the pumpkin thing. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure he'd say going into the, you know, since you're going to be seeding in the spring, it's, it's going to have to be something like an oat. I don't, I don't really know what else you could put in there for the pumpkins, you know, that you're going to get seeded uh, yet this spring. Most people, when they do that, well, like I think you did too, like for who answered, who asked that question, you, you're doing your cereal rye earlier and it just didn't work. So um, I guess the oats would be the one you'd have to try. Okay, I don't see any more questions. I think I got through all of them. Uh, the um, Make sure you send me an email if you have any question uh, that I didn't get to here. You want to talk about something uh, in addition? And um, going to go from here. Thanks. Hope to see you next week. Hope to see you for the next 10 weeks. And we're real excited to have you on. And let's get the sun shining, get here to spring, and, and uh, get the growing season going. So thank you, everybody.